Calgary Liberal MP George Shalhall, a man who once ripped down posters of his opponent, shows that he has no care for Canadians, no care for Albertans, but he only cares for what the party tells him to do. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Now, I've been telling you for days that the Liberals are going into these committees hostile and aggressive and not honorable in any way, shape, or form. Quite the opposite of that. I mean, these are supposed to be people who are honorable. And I think that we see in this committee meeting for natural resources a a complete lack of understanding what the word even means. I watch a lot of committee. This is easily the worst one I've ever seen. I mean, the MP who's the chair, George Halal, Chahal, he was the guy that was caught ripping down his opponent's posters and putting up his own, with, which really should have been election fraud, right? That should be in election interference, and he should have been kicked out of the ability to run for office. But I will do that in a different video. This one was just a blatant disregard for anything that his position should do because he's the chair. He's supposed to be neutral. Nothing even close to that. He was giving everything to the liberal uh, ministers. He was letting them get away with all kinds of stuff, you know, because they came in there acting like petulant little children because they can't get their own way and they don't know how to behave otherwise, right? They're not capable of, of, of hearing no. Oh, they were over. It, it is completely and utterly beyond the pale. I mean, this guy should be censured at bare minimum, bare minimum. It is absolutely, you're going to see. And I mean, it wasn't just one or two incidents. This went on for the entire time. So they're talking about the uh, pipeline that cost Canada 35, that the conservatives were going to have built by a private company, but the liberals decided that the taxpayer would build it and take $35 billion out of our uh, coffers to spend on this private industry bill or pipeline and of course they announced the other day that they want the oil and gas industry to cut one third of their emissions very reasonable right i mean do they have any idea what's going on in the country at all are they aware of how much hardship people are going through apparently not apparently they can just arbitrarily start talking about stuff and they don't care how it impacts the economy they don't care how it impacts you now MP Stubbs, who is from Alberta, gets the first question. And I am telling you right now, it went for about two minutes, and then the wheels come right off. How can um, the Liberals and your anti-energy, anti-private sector um, colleagues possibly justify imposing an oil and gas cap on Canada, a job-killing oil and gas cap on Canada? Having said that, my question was it is, having said area. that, it is absolutely um, inappropriate for conservatives to criticize our government when it comes to pipelines. First of all, she's not there to tell. It's not question period. This is, uh, you're called to the bar, to the table because you're a, um, a member of the cabinet, because you're a, a minister. And he, she asked you a question that... Per, absolutely 100% pertains to your jacket, right? Because it's the economy that's going to be devastated. Now that whole, I cut it out, but those, that was the end of the question. And then that was the end of the answer. And right here, which is probably about two minutes in, the wheels come off. And remember, I'm trying to talk to you, not just about the chaos that's flying around this committee and the lack of professionalism and the lack of impartiality that the liberal ministers portray, their lack of caring about what's happening to Canada in any way, shape, or form, but how this liberal chair doesn't even try to hide his bias. He just completely abuses his his position. He completely and utterly takes everything that the conservatives say and robs them of even the right to of of, a fair treatment of equal treatment it is well you can decide here we go there was in in the calgary herald uh, in the calgary herald there was a senior alberta energy leader talked about this as a nation building project and it was our government that got it because of your lack of getting pipelines done does it self-impose an oil and gas a job killing oil and gas cap on itself the united states does it 
The key question here is who got a pipeline built and who... No, that's not the key question at all. The question was asked to you. That's what matters. You were asked a question and it's your obligation to answer it. So and the answer is that our United government States built does it's not. a nation How building project that is contributing meaningfully to our national prosperity and to good wages for Canadian workers. I'm I think that, about that is a record I am proud to stand on. Okay. Uh, I'm happy to answer the, the question um, I'm ask, about the emissions cap. I mean, the emissions cap has not actually been announced uh, to date, but it is both an important part of reducing carbon emissions in line with uh, what Minister science tells us we must. Um, can I ask you to hold? One sec. We have a point of order. Go ahead, Mr. Falk, on a point of order. Uh, uh, Member Stubbs specifically asked a question to Minister Freeland, and I think it would only be appropriate and uh, proper for Minister Freeland to answer the question and not Minister Wilkinson. Okay, now watch this. I would say that the emissions cap actually you falls within know, my um, area of authority. And sorry, Minister, uh, sorry, sorry uh, Mr. Falk, I'm going to ask you to hold a sec um, to address your point of order. Um, procedurally, um, a question was asked to Minister Freeland, but the emissions cap does fall under Minister Wilkinson's uh, mandate and jurisdiction. So um, if you want a specific question on that, I think that is appropriate for Minister Wilkinson to answer. But, uh, you know, I will go back to Unbelievable. Stubbs because it is her time to ask the questions. But I would allow, this is a good reminder for committee members, if you ask a question, allow the ministers to answer so they can give a fulsome answer to the question asked. Um, so, Ms. Stubbs, I'm going to go back to you, and if you'd like to direct that question. Mr. Chair, and I certainly will when the question is actually answered. So, Minister Wilkinson, can you confirm whether or not Canada's biggest competitor and customer of the United States, whether the OPEC producers, Canada's biggest competitors in hostile regimes, whether Mexico, Canada's North American competitor, whether Norway, whether European countries, whether countries in South Africa or South America impose on themselves a job killing oil and gas emissions cap can you confirm that's what he said right he said i can answer that question now first of all the chair doesn't get to decide who asks what question of whom he doesn't or she doesn't they don't have that right but this guy's saying well i think that it's a reason it's not reasonable for him to interrupt a conversation and to just stick his nose into the conversation because a mr freeland doesn't know the answer and because mr freeland is getting overrun by uh, mp stub stubs because she's completely trashing the floor with her and the buddy has to run to her assistance now we got three liberals ganging up on this entire question all the while trying to run out the clock right so what are they hiding if they're running out the clock why are they running out the clock well they must be up to something because when when let's be honest when the liberals have something Thing, they stand up there with paper in hand and they get on there and they beat their chests and they're like, oh, so when they're hiding, when they're trying this kind of tactics, they are obviously hiding something. MP Wilkins did say, Wilkinson did say that he could answer the question, that he'll take the question. So you heard her ask the question, right? Do they oppose a, a, a cap on, a, on their emissions? All of these oil producing regions of the world, do they do that? Yes or no? And he was he was, she was asking the question of Freeland, and he said he could answer it, so she repeated the question and asked Wilkinson, though I can tell you right now that if MP Chahal had, asked, had spoken to me that way, there would, be, there would be no question that wouldn't be asked of him. Nonetheless, this guy said that he could answer the question. It's, Halal said he could answer the question, or Chahal, whatever, is, I can't pronounce it. It's C-H-A-H-A-L, so there's a lot of ways that could be pronounced. Nonetheless, they both said that Wilkinson was the best choice to answer this question. She asked the question. Watch this answer. And, I love and in truth, European countries are all backing yeah. away, actually, from these policies because they're causing unreliable and too expensive. But that's Essentials actually not like true. Energy, power, that's not fuel. true. Um, it is absolutely It is true. not true. If you actually is, watch what the rest of the country true. is doing. It is not true. And the truth true. is that there is no other oil and gas producing country on you Earth. You just talked about Europe. Europe is actually doubling on down itself. on the energy transition because Germany it's both an energy security coal, and, coal, and a climate issue. And Sweden has announced a suspension of all activities towards their goal. Ms. Stubbs, I'll ask you to hold. We have a point of order. Go ahead. Mr. Just Gordon. for the sake of translators, we yeah. have two people, uh, Minister and uh, the, the, the person who's asking the question, Ms. Top, talking of each other. <laughs> I'm just, uh, aside from allowing the, you know, the minister to respond or the question to be finished, uh, I'm worried about the translators. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're worried about the translator. You're not worried about everyday ordinary Canadians. But this is a tactic that the liberals use to interrupt people's trains of thought, right? They, every time they, they know that their people are getting, you know, crushed, 
they say, oh, the translator. You got the thing in your ear, bud. What's the translator got any differently in their ear? If the translator has a problem, the translator can let the person beside the, the chair know. They have a system for that. I mean, they spend the whole first five, 10 minutes of these committee meetings every single time talking about how to take care of the translator's ears. Nobody is uh, needing your assistance there, bud. But you know that, well, excuse me, I shouldn't say it like that, right? Because you know that MP Wilkinson needs your assistance. You need, they know that you need to get him out of the hot water while he sits there and lies through his teeth about what the uh, rest of the world is doing and pertains to the um, Paris Accords. Mr. Jawari, it's a very good point uh, and a point of order that you've raised. Uh, colleagues uh, speaking over each other does not make the jobs of our interpreters any easier. It makes it much more difficult. So uh, I'll address you, sir, in uh, one second. So I would ask um, uh, Ms. Stubbs, uh, with your time, to ask the question, but also allow the minister to have time to answer the question, um, you know, reasonably in a reasonable amount of time. She was talking and he interrupted her. Um, and, I'm, and I hope that addresses your concern and the concerns of this committee members as well. Uh, Mr. Howland on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I agree with my colleague, Mr. Jawari, about showing respect for our interpreters, but I hope, Chair, that you would see in this in the last exchange, Ms. Stubbs actually had not gotten to her question and it was the minister that interrupted her. And I would also ask the minister to please respect the uh, interpreters and let Ms. Stubbs finish before he <laughs> thank you. to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Howland, um, for providing that and agreeing with Mr. Jory. I just will say that um, uh, Mr. Wil Minister Wilkinson was interrupted as well through providing his answer, so it, it goes several ways. I would ask all colleagues... He really wasn't, right? But we see now what I'm talking about. This guy is just, you know, he, he's just... He might as well be sitting on their lap whispering in their ear. Like, it's despicable to ask and allow an answer from the minister uh, i think we can set the ground rules that we can give them enough time to make sure they can give a fulsome answer to the very important questions they're asking you got about 20 seconds left so i'm gonna turn it back over to you you can get a quick question in if you like and um we can move forward thank you now i'll say at this point that this kind of partisanship bothers me a lot because they're all supposed to be there working for Canadians. And how many times do they try to make those sound bites where they're saying, oh, we will work with anybody? I mean, the NDP asked the question of them, right? Charlie Angus was in the room and he goes, oh, do you believe in climate change? I mean, what kind of a ridiculous, what, what, what are we talking about? I mean, he says that he's looking after his region, but he's not running again, but he's got a lot of miners in that region. You think that mining is run with electrical vehicles? Unbelievable. It's just ridiculous. And that kind of partisanship, putting your own little party lines ahead is exactly what the far left loves to do. That's what they, that's how they identify with each other. They only work with their own people. They don't work with anybody else. Now, MP Chahal says that she has 20 seconds left. Okay. Now I want you to pay attention that in this 20 seconds, she doesn't ask a single question. She simply runs out the clock. Then I want you to see what he does right after that. The reality is none of those, none of those um, countries are imposing a job-killing oil and gas emissions cap on themselves because they know it will hurt their people and their economies. And your collective failures after nine years on pipelines have maxed out pipeline capacity. Those combined will cut production, oil and gas production, jobs, businesses, and money from Canada, no matter what you say. And um, that is actually the truth about what is occurring here. And um, you do owe it to Canadians especially the small and medium-sized producers, operators, indigenous communities, and, co and contractors, who all together, including with chambers of commerce and other private sector proponents, Ms. are Stubbs, saying your emissions we are cap will damage Canada time. catastrophically. Um, and Minister, uh, we are at time, but I can give you... Not a question was asked. If you have a, a five-second answer there, you can provide to that 10 seconds. Go ahead. I didn't ask the question, I made a statement. Go ahead, if you'd like to provide a short okay. short answer. What are you talking about? The fact is, the our government built a pipeline Ridiculous. to Tidewater. The Conservatives failed to do so. And as a oh, point of on. fact, the capacity is not yet fully utilized. That's the fact. Thank you, Minister. We will now go to Ms. LaPointe. Ms. LaPointe, you have six minutes and the floor is yours. I mean, I guess anybody that will rip down a flyer is not really an honorable person anyway, is it? I mean, it, there's a clip of it right here. I took it from the CBC. <clears throat> the 
liberal MP George Chahal fined for election flyer controversy tweeted as he accepted the and paid the penalty because he went up to somebody's door that had his uh, running opponent up there and he ripped down the flyer. That's election interference. He should have never been allowed to run. That should be a crime. That should be like, you know what, you're looking at two years in jail, buddy, because you did you are interfering with the, the democratic system. So, I mean, this is not the kind of person who, who exudes very much honor. We can all agree on that. And I think up to now you've seen it, but it's not it doesn't end there. Like that's not that's not all of it. He just basically crawled into their you know what's and, and camped out. I mean, this has obviously been contrived from the beginning. Like they went to him before the meeting in their one of the little caucus meetings and they said, okay, when we go to this thing, we have to make sure that we burn it because we can't get any Canadians to realize that we are destroying the economy, that we are trying to make them go back to the stone ages, that we are trying to destroy the electricity production, that we are trying to destroy all of the things that they know that they recognize as being in the first world so that we can take control of the situation so that we can, you know, make them live like the Flintstones and of course this guy having absolutely no honor at all just agreed for it and because he doesn't have any tact or any nuance or any subtlety all he can do is just be you know act like it's a hammer you know what I mean he's about as subtle as a sledgehammer and we see all of us can see exactly what's happening in this in this committee meeting this is complete and total well, this is this, you know what I mean? If I was this guy, I would be embarrassed. I would resign right away and just say, you know what? I'm going to go back to the private sector because I cannot handle the public sector. I'm not strong enough of character. I'm not strong enough of will. I don't know. Tell yourself whatever you want to tell yourself. But you really should just get out of politics. You should get out of the public eye because your behavior is... I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find a strong word that might not offend everybody. Like, you know what I mean? That might not get the censors all up in, up in arms, but I'm telling you right now, this is unacceptable for any person, never mind a person who is supposed to be one of the, you know, leaders of the country. It's despicable and they should all be ashamed of themselves because they clearly set this up. So I left that little tidbit about the, uh, now it's the, you know, so-and-so's turn, like the next uh, speaker. And then she finished her six minutes. And then this is what, this is what happened. Yes, my apologies, but I was trying to listen to the uh, the minister's comments and Mrs. Stubbs was having a side discussion with Mr. Patzer and she, she seems to do that quite a bit. I'm wondering, given that the Point ministers are here, we'd all like to hear each other and I would just like to ask my honorable colleague to not talk while the minister's responding. So, thank, uh, you. thank you and I'll address your point of order, Mr. Patzer, after I deal with Mr. Shifke's um, colleagues there. Um, you can have conversations and if you want to have conversations around the table, you can take them outside the room or in the back corner or whisper maybe at a very low voice if there's a, a conversation you need to have with one of your colleagues but I know it can be disruptive for colleagues uh, if there's cross conversations that are uh, interrupting your focus and attention um, so thank you um, I'll go to you Mr. Patzer on a point of order yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I mean, like that's that's pretty ridiculous, is what that is, right? That's not, that wasn't even a point of order, Mr. Chair. Um, colleagues always have little conversations can you amongst tell me themselves. What your at the point table. of order is, Mr. Patzer? My point of order is is that, oh, that he's deliberately that. trying to waste time, and this is not even a it wasn't even relevant. We we can have conversations about what's going on in the room here, and we don't need him to be so, uh, you know uncle paternalistic thank here you, on everybody. Thank you, Mr. Patzer. Um, his point of order. Members, like, we're all doing a job so here for debate. Thank you, Ms. Right? Stubbs, uh, Mr. Kitchen. Patzer, on your point of order. We are doing our jobs and Mr. Angus is waiting patiently so he can do his job. I will ask colleagues, um, let's not be disruptive. Let's focus on uh, the committee meeting that we have today with the ministers. I'm going to go to you, Mr. Angus. You have six minutes. I mean, if there was any question about my assessment that this guy was completely, totally attacking the conservatives, that he was abusing his position as the chair to bully the conservatives so that we wouldn't hear how little the liberals care about what's going on in the country how we wouldn't hear how these guys say that they care about the economy while they turn around and, and impose a, a, an unachievable emissions cap there's just no way that we can do that without shutting down a third of the production the, this is already the cleanest oil on earth and they want more 
For what? Trying to spew it out by the megaton every second. This, this, is un, un, this is unconscionable. Now, I know I'm a little fired up, but sometimes fired up is what you have to be. Because, you know, it's, it's time that these politicians realize that, you know what? Enough is enough is enough is enough. We're all aware. We're all watching. Your behavior is being checked and balanced and all that stuff. So I'm not sure that this is the kind of character that should be looking after the country, but you have to wonder, right, why he's so hot to try to shut down oil. Is he maybe being influenced by foreign investments? So now we go to, to the second round, right? Mr. MP Halan gets a shot. And, of course, MP Chehal doesn't, want to, doesn't really try to cross him at all. They both come out of Calgary, right? So, Thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister Fleen, how many jobs, Canadian jobs, will be lost with your job-killing uh, oil and gas cap? Um, I was under the clearly mistaken impression that we were here to talk about the TMX pipeline, a pipeline which we got built, and the Conservative government It's very government fair that a minister didn't. comes to committee and since we're, we're talking about jobs, I'm glad to point like, out 35,000 jobs resources. were created during the building of the pipeline, okay, and well, that's great. How many jobs will be lost with the emissions cap? I just need the number, Minister. There will be tens of thousands of jobs created as a result of the emissions cap. If you just look I just at need a number. the, the many, Shell Polaris project, the created? Strathcona project, the uh, the Pathways project that we all hope will move ahead, all the jobs that were created through the implementation of methane reduction what's, technologies, what's the number? this is an enormous opportunity that will create tens of thousands of tens jobs of in thousands. Alberta. You what's see it with Lindy, you see it with their products, Minister, you see it with Dow and Minister, this first net the zero number? petrochemical facility, you see it with the Imperial Biofuel facility. Minister, just My goodness, I mean, go and have a look at what's happening on the ground. If you don't have the number, just say so. <laughs> Tens of thousands. Okay. So you're saying tens of thousands of jobs will be created. Deloitte has estimated that 110,000 jobs will be lost in Canada due to your job-killing oil and gas cap. Mm -hmm. Are you confirming today that tens of thousands of jobs will be more than 110,000 jobs that, you've, that you're going to drive away from Canada? Yes or no? I just need a yes or no. Look, um, <laughs> the oil and gas cap is intended to incent economic activity and the long-term competitiveness of the oil and gas sector while doing what we need to do oh, to uh, address the climate issue. It is so very I'll disturbing that no, for me very, that the Conservative Party of Canada so I'll, I'll increasingly on. seems to so be a group of climate deniers. Minister, At the end of the day, you Minister, have to actually address that answer. issue and address it in a manner that's going to create economic opportunity. Hey, your your questions are ridiculous. At the end of the day, we have Ms. Stubbs, we got a point of order. You know what? Uh, once again, colleagues. And I wouldn't deign to um, Stubbs, lecture anyone. I, I want to answer your point of order. If I could ask you to just pause, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, colleagues, once again, um, question and allow time for an answer. Um, just so, uh, Ms. Trowland, you have time to ask your question, and the minister has time to provide a fulsome answer to your question. He asked him. One simple question took 10 seconds, and this guy started to meander about going and seeing what's on the ground, and he called the question ridiculous, and he did all of that, and this chair ignored it, right? Pointing his finger at people like he's the principal of a school or something. And MP uh, Wilkinson wasn't asked the question. But I'll tell you something of what I did notice. I did notice that Wilkinson was talking about projects that he hopes to get started. We are all hoping we'll get started. So nothing right now, zero. And when, when Minister Freeland wanted to answer the question, she pulled up a piece of paper and said 35,000. She pointed her finger to it. I can tell you that there was 35,000. She was so pleased with herself. Because if they have the answer, that's what they do. And if they don't have the answer, that's because two things. One, they didn't think of it. It never crossed their mind. And two, they just want to run out the clock. So he doesn't really have the answer, but he can't say that, right? He's, he's, he's incapable of that, especially a guy like him. His whole entire identity is wrapped up in his, him thinking that he's smarter than everybody in the room. He's not, but he believes that he is. I know his kind, believe me when I tell you, that he believes that he is the intellectual superior of every person everywhere all the time. And you hear yourself that all he really does is ramble, 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 rather than just say, man, I don't know the answer. Tens of thousands. Then he heard the number 110,000 and he lost his marbles. He was like, oh my God, I should have said a million. But he doesn't know anything. 
So you might as well say a million because you have no idea. And that's obvious, but it doesn't matter because the chair still come into the rescue, saved them. And you can hear Miss Stubbs or MP Stubbs had no time for the chair at this by this point. She was just talking because she wanted to talk and she was completely ignoring what he has to say. And I don't blame her. I mean, if you can't be impartial, you can't be the chair. You want to play politics, you get out of the chair and you go sit on your side of the table. But if you want to be the chair, you have to be impartial. Now, to his credit, MP Helen is quite calm, quite rational. I am telling you right now, if I was in the room, I would be, they would all be hearing it for me. Like, I know you look at me and you think, this guy is so warm and fuzzy, but I can't handle this kind of stuff. Like, this kind of stuff sets me off, right? Because I don't like being, I don't like bullies. And that's all this is. This is just high paid bullies. You know what I mean? And I don't like them. And I, I will never like them. So, but MP Helan, he seems to be quite, quite calm. <laughs> So if we can, yeah. I'll just I'll well, work within right those par parameters. Fair I enough. Think I'll, I'll move smooth. on because Go the ahead. minister obviously with his non-answer proves that he admits that the jobs will not be recovered, the ones that he's going to lose with this emissions cap. So I'll move on. And I think it's important to note that it's my constituents and Albertans who are going to be impacted the most with this oil and gas cap that they know how many jobs will be lost because most of them will be out of work in that field because of you. I mean, most of the other people, the conservative benches from Alberta, and they are like, like not the bench, but the people asking the questions, the conservatives there are, are I mean, the one lady that's sitting beside MP Helan, um, she has uh, Fort McMurray in her, uh, in her writing, which is like the oil producing capital of, you know, the Western Hemisphere. So now MP Helan turns his question back to uh, Mr. Freeland and he, he switches it up a little bit. <laughs> and you, you don't even, like this, you can't miss this. This is like, they have just thrown all of the rules out of the window at this point. Mr. Freeland, you preside over one of the worst GDP per capita growth since the Great Depression. Can you confirm that you've done an impact assessment that the, what this oil and gas cap will do to your deficit? <laughs> so. Okay, there are so many untrue statements embedded in what you've said, so I'm going to have to go after them I one by one. I just one. want an answer to my question. Do, have you done an uh, impact assessment? I, I actually wasn't given a chance GDP to answer. On GDP and GDP per capita growth. I just need that answer. I didn't so, ask for anything uh, else. Once again, uh, Mr. Allen, you've asked your question. I want to give the minister an opportunity to answer Disgusting. your question. Minister Freeland, please go ahead and provide an answer. It is absolutely appropriate for me to make clear the falsehoods embedded in your question. It is not okay for me to just drive by those. So I'm going to go through them systematically. Just the GDP per capita, is it not the worst? If, if that was the, the, only, if that was the only question you wanted to ask, you didn't need to offer all of the false fluff to begin with. So let me go it, after the fluff. It would be nice for you so to answer so we go. can move on. So, Mr. Allen... Uh, and Ms. Freeland, if you could get direct and um, answer the questions uh, that he's asked and provide a provide an answer. Oh, oh, I'll be direct. Thank you, Chair. Well, no, so no, no, no. Hold on, Mr. Howland. I want to give Minister Freeland it's a time, time to answer not the hers. question. So, it's uh, his time. Minister Freeland, briefly provide an answer to the question. I, I simply can't let the falsehood stand. So first of all, you began by saying something untrue about what my colleague, Minister Wilkinson, said. Minister Wilkinson was very clear that we believe wow. that our policies are both bringing down emissions and bringing good jobs to Canada Wh and Canadians. Which is not true, okay? We Minister, believe since you're we not can gonna answer, and must do I have both. about a minute left. In terms I would, I'd of like GDP, since we're Minister, here to dollar, talk about... No, you didn't actually... You didn't order, you didn't so actually we have a point of order, uh, Minister Freeland, and I know you're going to the GDP um, answer, but I have a point of order from... Minister, uh, yeah, we just note the bizarre spectacle of extremely powerful elite ministers um, of the government of Canada, of a G7 country, so, uh, constantly, Stubbs, that's not a point constantly of shutting down and cutting off both women member of parliaments and um, an ethnically diverse so, uh, member um, of parliament. So here, perhaps these guys I, who love to play okay, identity politics, so, just answer the question. Colleagues, uh, first of all, um, <laughs> Minister Freeland is also a strong woman in the government who's here answering questions. Yeah, I certainly don't think let's she has not, a with the Let's heat. not target members based on their gender or their ethnicity. 
Um, I'll ask everybody to let's everybody just uh, take a deep breath and tone down a notch. So we can get back to the issue at hand today. That's the trend Chair, mountain pipeline expansion. You do, Mr. Helen, have time. So I have it on hold, on next but I do have at a point of order I have right. to address. Like Minister Freeland, a brief. <laughs> I, I want to give you a, a chance to answer on the GDP brief, and I'm going to go back to you, Mr. Helen, uh, on the GDP answer you're just about to give, and then uh, we'll go back to you. Okay, TMX, which we're supposed to be here to talk about, is adding 0.25% to Canada's GDP. That is important. In the G7, Canada will have the second strongest GDP growth this year, and the IMF forecasts that we will have the strongest GDP growth next year. And it looks like we're achieving a soft landing after the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Minister, uh, just to correct your falsehood, you said 0.25% in GDP. In fact, your, your gas cap oil and gas cap is going to take a 1% hit to our GDP, according to Deloitte. You can shake your head all you want, Minister Wilkinson, but that's the truth. Yeah. Now, the dollar is trading at $72 right now. In your budget, you had projected WTI would be at $78. Currently, it's at $71. In The PBO recently said you will blow through your, your projected budget by $7 billion, which we know because... Either you can't do math or you can't manage or both. Now, can you please confirm just the number? How much time worse is, with those nice. will the it's deficit so be? Time is up and a, a brief answer, please. What will the deficit be? Mr. Helen's question was incoherent and it wasn't clear. He said the dollar is trading at, I think he meant oil, but he, he, he mushed up his words in his minister. word salad. So it's really impossible to answer a question which is so you don't want to incoherent because you know and how bad the answer will be. Thank okay, you. time is up. We're going to go to our next uh, speaker, Mr. George. She has nothing. She has nothing. She only has these little condescending, contemptuous little side, uh, you know, rabbit holes or whatever you want to call them, little side trails. She had no answer. And of course, she thinks in her mind that by not having to admit it, that she's somehow saving the her saving face. But she, she may as well have, she would have admitted it less than the disaster what this is. So then we heard from the other, the next round, you know, everybody was kumbaya. The, the block kind of went at them a little bit, but not super, not, not to the point where the conservatives were trying to save the economy and save this country. No, but the the NDP, I mean, they were just, they might as well have just went over there and polished their shoes. I mean, Charlie Angus is a empty suit, as they like to say. So now they want to say, oh, we're out of time. They only gave us one hour. So that's why I can tell you that this was a plan, right? The two ministers come in, they overlap one another, they start running out the clock. So instead of getting to the three rounds of questionings, they only got to two rounds of questionings. If they were so sure of themselves, if they were so serious, they would want these things on the record. They wouldn't want the time to be running out, but they want the time to run out because they know that what is actually happening is not anything what they're claiming to be happening. Everybody knows at the Bank of Canada. So now we come to the last round and the lady whose name I can't remember the MP from Fort McMurray she says oh let me let me have a point of order and you will not believe the you just can't believe it you can't believe it thank you uh, ministers um, point of order uh, yes on a point of order Ms. Goodridge um, we started our meeting a little bit late I would just ask if we could have um, permission to complete even a partial third round um, this is critical for Canadians um, and we don't often so, have an opportunity to have Ms. two ministers Ms. Goodridge I was just about to address that thank you we um, unfortunately are at the end of time the ministers uh, did give us the first hour to join us here at committee today i want to thank both ministers freeland and wilkinson but for mr. joining chair. us and the meeting is um, mr suspended. chair i'm asking for five minutes for us to be able to continue did anybody see any honorable behavior in any of that what i saw was a bully what i saw was a man who was abusing the rights of his chair to silence dissent Imagine that you voted for this person and imagine how he would act when you want something from him that he doesn't agree with. Imagine what four more years of this government will look like. I mean, even one more year. Now the veneer starts to come away, right? Now that they realize that nobody believes any words coming out of their mouth, they don't care anymore. 
they are just snapping and snarling and acting like, well, there's no, there's, I don't see any, anything were honorable in their behavior. Now I know I don't normally come down this hard on them, but this merited that. I mean, this is a complete and utter, I mean, it's, I'm almost embarrassed for them. Can you imagine how this would look if people from other countries saw it? We were supposed to be a G7 outfit and these liberals, they came in there with a scheme. They schemed it out, and which is why you you saw him bring the hammer down, because the idea was to cut the question short, because they know that it's a horrible situation. That's why they came in together instead of coming in one at a time, because they didn't want one hour by themselves. And I mean, anybody looking at it knows what I'm saying. It's just that it, it's it's a it's it's embarrassing to think that this is what a Canadian politician behaves like in Canada. Unbelievable. And think about the idea that that not only is the um, Minister of Finance, she's also the Deputy Prime Minister. She would be in charge if something went, you know, if, for, for whatever reason. She's next in line. Wrap your mind around this person being the, the most powerful politician in Canada. She's already like, no, number two, put the, her finger on, you know, in the, in the cookie jar and being second in command. This is her, this is how she behaves. It's, it's terrible. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.